We had to leave the transport on Severac Le Chateau's ashen slopes. No one was going to steal it. Ghosts are lousy drivers. We've been marching for about six hours. Like icebreakers, we plowed through the ashes. There is a blackened mountain range ahead of us, enameled and cracked by heat and sheer pressure. Hard and warped like a fused lava, the ground is still warm to the touch. Its gnarled surface is covered with solidified bursts, their sharp edges jutting out like briar patches. We have to be careful. Lomark has already punched a hole in his boot sole. We should be near the Massif Central, close to Verrier. Beaujolais originated somewhere around here. Not my cup of tea. Not enough foam. But that was then. I cannot place the range directly ahead. Two valleys are supposed to meet there. We need to get closer. Impressive. We see the crater's edge now. The grounds... No. The whole damn country has been transformed. Like ripples from a droplet falling into still water. Concentric rings of rock protrude from the point of impact. Not high. Just enough to form a nice line with the surrounding peaks of the Massive's mountains. The old, blending with the new. Lomark thinks he's seen a wasp. Nonsense. Not even a shadow of the past remains here. He insists, and I call him an idiot. Night falls. We crawl into our plastic tubes and sleep. Lomark says he's been awake for hours. He found more wasps and offers me a dusty lump. That's enough. I set out. He hurries after me. We scramble up the slope, each step leaving avalanches of rumble in our wake. I must be exhausted. I keep on seeing mandalas taking shape in the settling debris before Lomark disturbs and dissolves them underfoot. I nod towards Lomark. He waves back. It's okay. Everything's okay. Nearing the top, I keep sinking into the ash drifts. Wind hits me and I stumble. The swirling ash reduces my sight to a few meters. I crawl on, feeling the incline. I start sliding and fight against it. For a moment, the dirt engulfs me. Darkness is all around, but I slide out and hit a ledge. I manage to hold on. Around me, everything crackles and rustles. I cough and spit, rub the ashes from my goggles, and look back. The rim of the crater is more than 10 meters above the slope. I can make it. I'm in. Wisps of dust and ashes fly over the crater's edge like an ugly borealis. I take in the crater's interior. A giant concave bowl stretching into the far distance. I recognize one of the mountains at the center and I take a closer look. Give my eyes time to adjust. Structures take shape. Circles with prongs, triangles, all interwoven and bordering each other. I remember metal filings on a piece of paper with a magnet below. That's not it. Rather like dust on a beating drum. But that doesn't explain the prongs. I hear Lomar coughing next to me. Do you see that? I ignore him. The smoke. He points to the slope ahead. It's true. There's black smoke in the air. I drop to one knee, slide a little lower, and get real close. Wispy, black, gossamer. I trail one hand through it, and it disappears as if neutralized by some chemical reaction with my glove. I rake the dirt, digging up a fist-sized jet-black stone. It melts into smoke in my hand, ebbing in long, oily smears. I touch the stone, feel the surface give. It's not warm. A bug shoots out. I cry out and wince as it crawls away in a zigzag line, boring its vibrating backside into the soil. It's gone. The entry hole caves in. I feel Lomark's breath against my ear. He whispers, wasps. I remove my glove. I want to feel the black stone. Again, I trail my hand through the smoke and again, it disappears. I look down at my hand, inspecting it from all angles. There's a trace of black on my fingers, but it seems to dissipate. No, sink in. I anxiously rub my hand, shake it, make a fist. Adrenaline buzzes in my veins now. My heart races, my breath quickens. There's a moment of panic and I quickly put the glove back on. 
take photos, I order Lomark as I slip some of the black substance into a specimen model. It liquefies at once, but I flick the cap closed before it escapes. From the corner of my eye, I see black spots scuttle across the floor next to my feet. Some of them rise and fly away, against the wind. What have we gotten ourselves into? Somehow, this is all connected. I put away the vial. Back at the camp, I enter quarantine. It's a small taste of luxury, my own tent, room service. Boredom is my only friend. After one day, Dr. Bruceville sees no reason to keep me here any longer. We call him Dr. Slime, which is unfair because he keeps everything together. He doesn't care about the black smoke. The only things that concern him are diarrhea, phlegm, or hive. There's no machine to screen my hand. Even if there was, what good would it do? I feel healthy, but Dr. Rooseville wants me to record any change in my condition. My lungs rattle, probably from too much ash. My sputum is foamy. There are some red splotches on my chest now. Itchy. I write that down. I keep thinking about the mandalas that I saw in the crater. When the red splotches on my body begin forming a similar pattern, I should be surprised. But I am not. Time passes quickly. I am coughing up dense blobs now. They are slimy, yet compressed and fluffy. Noted. I still feel good. There are ants in my tent. I feel them crawling all over my skin during the night. In the morning, I see the trails they've left in the dirt in front of my cot. Mandalas. My heart feels heavy and hot. Every breath I take burns intensely. I can somehow smell what is cooking at the other end of the camp. I recognize my friends by their body odors. I sometimes think I can even see the smells. The world is full of glowing traces of complex information. I am delirious. Dr. Rooseville and the other smelly apes tried to hold me down. I got so agitated that the glands on my neck burst open. They simply let go of me, staring at me bug-eyed. Rooseville vomited without bending forward. It just spilled out of him. The smell was intense for my old senses, but for my new self, it was a simple message. I ran out of the camp. No one stopped me. The wasps talked to me. Theirs is a simple language of movement and smells. I move along the lines they trace into the air, leading me from the ruins into a dying forest. It still smells of pine needles, but underneath, I detect other nuances I do not yet understand. It has something to do with birth. That much I can feel. I finally fall to my knees, digging in the dirt with my hands. Yes, birth. My heart sits within my chest, leaden and fiery, pumping and stomping. The mandalas now burn upon my skin, a hotbed of white flakes. I feel skin and flesh tug and tear along the lines. Something within me wants out. I break down, exhale flakes and see them rise. Feel my body mold up, sink into the ground. Deep within my skull, something stirs. Something human, ancient. It is fear, screaming, rebirth.